Hi, my name is Liz Rice. I run the open source engineering team at Aqua Security, where we build tools to help enterprises secure their cloud native deployments. And I'm also chair of the technical oversight committee for the CNCF. I've been interested in containers and container security for quite a long time now. And I often find myself talking about the dangers of running containers as root. So I'm really interested in rootless containers, which I'm going to explain to you today. Uh, and th as they bring a lot of security benefits because we will no longer be running containers as root. In the past, I've done a talk uh, where I've shown what a container is by building one in about 60 lines of Go code. And I'm going to do something pretty similar today, but this time focusing on how to make a container rootless. I'm not going to assume that you've seen that other talk, but I won't have time today to go into all the details that I have done in, in other talks. So I'll share a link at the end in case you want to explore some of those other details that I might skip over a bit today. So I am going to be coding a container today. It's going to be rootless. Let's start by exploring the motivation behind rootless containers. So by default, generally speaking, containers run as root. If you've been running with Docker or Kubernetes, unless you specify a user, you're going to run as root, not just root inside the container, the same root as on the host. So let's just uh, show what I mean here. I have two windows onto the same uh, virtual machine and we can run, uh, let's run an Alpine container. And if I find out what ID I'm running under, it tells me I'm root. I have the ID of zero and uh, the name root. But you might be thinking that's inside the container. What does that matter? Well, let's take a look from the host perspective. So I'm going to run a long sleep process and I'm going to look for that on the host. Let's sleep. And there are a couple of sleep processes running, but here's the one that I just started with a thousand seconds. And as you can see, it is running as root from the host's perspective, not just from the container's perspective. They are one and the same thing. So we could override that by specifying a user either with a dash dash user parameter when we invoke Docker or by specifying a user when we build the, the container by putting a user command in the Docker file. But by default, we're going to be root. Incidentally, this isn't the case for all container runtimes. So for example, if you're using Red Hat's Podman, it doesn't run as root by default. Now, you might also have noticed that I invoked the, the Docker command here as a non-root user. I, I'm vagrant here and let's just exit out of this container and check my ID. And indeed, vagrant has the user ID 1000. So I'm not a root user, but I'm able to run the Docker command. And if you check out the, uh, the Docker documentation, you'll find a warning about this because if you're added to the Docker group so that you can run containers, so that you can run Docker com commands. If you can run containers, by default, they run as root. It's the same root as on the host. So by being a member of the Docker group, you effectively have root privileges. And this is a real problem in a multi-tenancy environment. For example, imagine a university scenario where you have a shared machine, lots of students who can SSH into that same machine. The administrator for that machine is not going to let those students run Docker because they could very easily get root access to the whole machine. And this is one of the big motivations behind rootless containers, being able to run containers 
without having to be rude. So the first aspect of rootless containers is this ability to start a container as a non-root user. And as you can see here, Docker supports this in uh, rootless mode, uh, mentioned here as an experimental feature. There is a second aspect to rootless containers, which is that we can fool the process inside the container into, well, it looks like root from the container's perspective, but it's not the same root as on the host. But before we can show what rootless containers are and how we create a rootless container, let's just talk a little bit about one of the main mechanisms that we use to create what we know as a container. And that is the kernel feature called namespaces. So a namespace limits what a process can see. For example, let's take the process ID namespace. If we give a container its own process ID namespace, it can only see those process IDs and it can't see the processes or the IDs from the rest of the machine. Similarly, you can have um, the Unix time sharing system namespace. Sounds very fancy in practice. The interesting thing that you can do with the UTS namespace is change the host name. So we can give a container its own host name that is independent of the host name for the host. And there are several types of these namespaces and one of them is the user ID namespace. And this is a user namespace and this is what we're gonna to use to create rootless containers. But let's start by just uh, running or creating something that looks a little bit like a container by using the Unix time sharing system namespace. Right, so here's the beginning of my Go program and it just has a little convenience function for panicking in the event of an error. I'm gonna write a main function and when I invoke this, I'm gonna do this by running go run main.go and that is go for building and then running the, the code that I have in this file. And that is roughly equivalent to uh, running the Docker executable. And if we were running Docker, we'd do something like Docker run image and a command, maybe some arguments to that command. And I'm gonna do something very similar in my executable here. I am gonna have a run command. I'm gonna not specify the image but I am going to let the user pass in the command they want to execute and some arbitrary list of arguments. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at argument one, which uh, we hope is going to be the keyword run. And if it is, we're going to run a function called run. And if it's anything else, I am going to collapse in a big heap. I'm confused as I expect to get run and I need a run function and for now let's just print out what we uh, what we see so far so we want this to run the command and possibly arguments that are specified by um, arguments to and onwards and while we're here let's also log out uh, as the user ID and the process ID which we can get from get effective user ID and get the process ID okay so I'm really not doing anything yet with this program but let's just run it to make sure it, it builds so go run main.go we need to specify run and we'd probably put some commands that we want to run and oh, i'll put in a new line to make things easier to read but we can see it tells us 
what it's been invoked with. In this case, I, I typed in some commands and it tells us that it's running as user ID 1000. We know that that's vagrant and it's got some high numbered process ID. Okay, so let's make it actually run whatever arbitrary command we've been passed. So we can do this by setting up a command uh, structure. So the first argument to this function is the name of the executable we want to run, which is in argument two. And then we pass in any subsequent arguments that may or may not be there. We also need to connect up std in, std out, and std r. Uh, std in, std out, and std r. Uh. So this gives us this CMD structure which describes the command that we want to execute in a new process. And I'm going to use my little must to make sure we catch any errors. We run the run method on this command and that will create the new create a process to run whatever command we've passed in. I've spelled args wrong. Okay. Let's try it. Some commands isn't legitimate Linux, so let's do something that is like echo hello. So we see our debugging line that tells us what it is we're going to run. We're going to run echo hello. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, we are the vagrant user with ID 1000. And we actually see the command being run. We see hello being printed to the screen, being echoed. So I haven't done anything very special here. It's, it's not containerized in any form yet but I've done something that can execute our arbitrary commands. The next step is to start creating namespaces for the child process in which this executable runs. And we can do this with the sysprocatra field. It's called procatra. And we say, here are some flags that we want you to use when you clone the new process. And we want you to create a new, and we said we'd do the UTS namespace. This is the one that allows you to change the host name independently of the host's host name. All right, so let's try running this. And it is not allowed. So I get operation not permitted. And that's because I am not allowed to create the UTS namespace without privileges to do so. If I'm root, I do sudo to make myself root, it works fine. So if I'm user zero, I, I have been able to execute this hello command. I could not just echo something, I could run a shell. This isn't going to return until I quit out of the shell. So now I'm running a shell as root user. Uh, let's confirm the ID. And now let's confirm whether or not that UTS namespace has worked. So I can run host name here. It's host. We'll just confirm that that is true on, from the host's perspective. Now inside the container, I'm going to change the host name to container and check that that's kind of stuck. So inside the container, the host name is container now, but from the host perspective, it's still host. So this is the first step down the road to containerization. I've been able to change the host name inside the container without affecting the host through the magic of namespaces. But I could only do that as root user. When I tried to run this as a non-root user, it wouldn't let me. So this is where uh, user namespaces are going to help us out. If we look at the man page for user namespaces, we can see that 
unprivileged processes are allowed to create them. So I don't have to be root to create a user namespace. Having created a child process in that new uh, user namespace, it gets the full set of capabilities. It can act effectively as root in this new user namespace. So I can start as an unprivileged user, create the user namespace, create a child process in that user namespace and have full privileges inside that user namespace. If I want to create some other namespaces as well, the user namespace gets created first. And that means that process can have privileges in all of the namespaces that get created. So in other words, where my program failed because I didn't have privileges to create the UTS namespace, it's going to create the new user namespace first if I add that into the, into the um, clone command. And having created the user namespace, it's now allowed to create the um, other any other namespaces that I specify. So let's try it. And there we go. So if we add in that we want to create not just the UTS namespace, but we also want a user namespace, and we quit out of the running container and we run it, I'll run it as a non root user. And it works fine. Let's run a shell as a non root user. I'm still running as user 1000. Let's see if I can change the host name. Host name container. I must be root to change the host name, but I thought I had privileges. Well, let's check the ID. So, I am a nobody inside this container. And the reason for this is the ID mapping that goes on when you create a user namespace. So I have a little picture to illustrate this. When we create a new user namespace, we can also map user IDs between the host and the new namespace. So if I want to be root inside the new namespace, I need to set up a mapping between some user on the host. Let's say we use 1000, the vagrant user that I've been using. And it's, it will map a set of users starting at that point uh, of length size. And sysprotatra actually gives us a... Uh, oops convenient field for setting up these UID mappings. So this is, I think it's actually a list of, let's check. Yeah, list of syscall, sysproc ID maps. And we get container ID. So inside the container, I want to be root, which is zero and host ID, which I want to map zero to 1000. And I only need to map one user ID. So we'll set a size of one. What have I done wrong here? Maybe I'm missing a comma. There we go. There is an equivalent group ID mapping, which I may as well also set up while we're doing these because just copy paste and change one character. Right. So now let's see who I am. Having set up this mapping of uh, user 1000 from the host to zero inside the container, 1000 on the host became zero in the container and I'm now running as root. So let's see if I can change the host name. I didn't complain. Change the host name inside the container 
but I've not affected it on the host. So as a unprivileged user, because I started as user 1000, I've been able to create a beginnings of a container that has its own isolated host name and it appears to be running as root. That's okay as far as it goes, but it's not really a full container and it has a, well, it's missing a lot of the characteristics of a container. First of all, right now I can see everything inside the hosts file system. And secondly, I can see all of the processes running on the host file system. And neither of those things is true in a real container, right? So let's add in some more namespaces so that we can uh, make this look a bit more like a real container. So we're going to add in um, the new NS, it's a mount namespace. Uh, namespace and we are going to add in we want new process ID namespace okay that looks easy enough let's try it so what if I run PS looks exactly the same as it did before I can still see all the processes from the host and the reason for this is because when I run PS to look at processes, it's actually looking in uh, a pseudo directory slash proc. If I look at slash proc, inside here there is a directory for every currently running process on the machine. And in fact, that's where the user ID mapping lives as well. So let's just find... Um, sleep like we did before. Um, let's find that sleep process. Okay, and if we look inside the slash proc directory, we find the user ID, uh, sorry, process ID for one of the processes inside the container. I'm going to call it 39995. And if we look at the user ID map, there's our mapping. This is the host uh, container ID zero maps to the host ID 1000 and it's of length one. Actually, right, when you create the user namespace, you get one chance to write user ID mappings into this file and that's done for us um, by the fact that we set this up uh, here. This is done by the underlying Go code. Right, so slash proc holds all sorts of interesting information about the running process. Um, let's have a look at some of the other interesting things in there just for fun. And we can see, for example, the executable is sleep. We can see the current working directory for that process. And it's from this slash proc directory that PS gets information about running processes. If I want to run PS inside my container and have it look only at processes inside the container, it's going to need a slash proc for itself that just has information about the containerized processes. At the moment, it's looking at slash proc on the host, and that's why it's seeing everything. So, in order to give it its own slash proc, we're going to give it its own root file system, and we're going to we're going to change the root of the container. This is also going to allow us to make this look more like a container by uh, making it run some different code. Right now, it's been it's had access to everything on my Ubuntu virtual machine. I happen to have on this machine, a copy of uh, an Alpine file system. I'm going to change the root inside my container to point to this uh, Alpine file system so that it can only see files from inside this uh, set of directories. <laughs> 
right now in order to do this i want to run cheroot and you might think well i could run it before i run the uh this run method here but that would affect root for the running process it wouldn't or we want it to only take effect for the child process there are a few different ways that we could go about this. I'm going to do it by a little trick of having this run process, uh, sorry, this run function create a child process, which is then going to go on and create the process to run our executable. This will make more sense as I do it, I promise. So I'm going to have a child function this child function doesn't need to create any namespaces or do any ID mappings or anything like that. This child function is going to execute our arbitrary command. But before it does that, I'm going to change the root. And I'm going to change that to home vagrant alpine file system so that it's looking at an alpine file system when you drive my editor correctly there we go when we change the root directory it actually leaves the current directory in an undefined state so it's a good idea to explicitly change directory we'll change to root okay so that's my child function taken care of. Now, I'm going to change this so that instead of executing the arbitrary command, it's going to call back into running this program again, which it can do by looking at proc self exe, which represents the currently running executable. So I'm going to have this executable create a child process to call itself again. But instead of having run as the um, keyword, it's going to pass in child so that it knows it's the second time around. And I just need to make this into a list of strings to which I append whatever the arbitrary command is and any arguments. And finally, up here, I need to say if we get invoked with the child keyword, call child. So when we first invoke this command, we invoke it with run and it sets up all the namespaces, creates a child process in which it calls itself, but with child as the keyword. So the child process instead of running run, runs child. And that's going to change the root directory and then execute our arbitrary command. Let's see how that goes. All right, so far so good. We are running as the root user inside process ID one. You'll notice this is starting from one. We're in our own process namespace, so process ID numbering has started again from scratch. But what if I actually, no, let's have a look at um, where we're running commands from. So for example, ls is coming from slash bin. Let's have a look at that. And it's actually a symbolic link to, or a link rather to Busybox. If you're familiar with Alpine, you'll know that many of the um, commands in slash bin are actually links to Busybox, which um, kind of contains them all inside one executable. Okay, so if I look at root, the root directory, we'll find that it matches what's inside home vagrant alpine fs we have successfully changed the root for this container so it can only see what's inside this uh, subdirectory this is effectively like the 
image file system, an unpacked image, uh, unpacked onto the host file system, and then the container can root to look at that uh, that subdirectory that, as if it's a file system. All right, there's one last thing we'd like to see working, and that's the ps command inside this container. But it's not quite working. And the th one thing we need to do to get this working is to tell the Linux kernel to treat slash proc inside this uh, container, to treat this as the special kind of proc file system in which it writes all that process information. And we do that by mounting it as a proc type file system. So I get a proc proc proc. And there we go. And we will tidy up at the end by unmounting this proc file system. Okay. Right, we're running as root inside a container that looks like the Alpine file system. And if we run PS inside this container, we only see the processes that we should see that are running inside this container. Not only that, we've been able to run this rootless because we've been able to do this as an unprivileged user. We're doing this as user. 1000. So that's what how we create a rootless container. And you might be wondering when you're going to be able to see that in your own containerized systems, you know, containerized system near you. And the good news is it's coming very, very soon. You already saw that in Docker, it's been available in experimental rootless mode. And uh, at the time I'm recording this, the uh, October 2020 release of Docker Engine isn't yet released, but the release notes have been uh, written and it tells us that rootless mode is expected to graduate from experimental. So by the time you see this, it's probably already available. In more good news, there is an enhancement proposal that's being worked on actively at the moment to support user namespaces inside Kubernetes. So I think you know, signs are looking good that we'll be able to use rootless containers in our own containers very soon. If you want to know more about rootless containers, uh, the rootless containers repository on GitHub uh, has lots of um, great resources and code. Uh, shout out to Akihiro Suda, who has done a lot of work on these rootless containers. And I also mentioned the talk where I dive into some of the other details on how a container is created. You'll find that on my GitHub under containers from scratch. I hope that's explained what rootless containers are. I'm more than happy to answer if you have any questions, just reach out. Thanks.